So it would be great to have um, your Bible or your Bible apps open um, at our Philippians reading. So Philippians chapter 2, as we begin in verse 12, there's an outline of the sermon on the back of the new sheet with translation points and space for notes, if that's helpful for you. And we begin with prayer. Almighty Father, as you have given us your word, give us now your spirit that we may understand and live the things which we hear. We pray this in Jesus' name. Amen. I wonder if you enjoy watching cooking shows, celebrity chefs. Do you enjoy planning, preparing and cooking an amazing dish? Or do you prefer just to eat the completed meal? There are many popular cooking shows like Nigella Lawson, who brings a unique blend of culinary expertise, personal charm and storytelling to cooking. I was surprised at the 7.30 service that one person admitted to watching Nigella regularly. Nigella emphasises the joy and comfort that cooking brings. It almost seems that cooking is more important than the finished product. As she blends personal anecdotes with her recipes, as she demonstrates the preparation of indulgent comfort food that are rich in flavour. Now, there is one phrase which features in most cooking shows. This is one I prepared earlier. The chef takes you through the ingredients and part of the cooking process, but there isn't time in the segment or the show to wait around for the completion of the dish. So the perfectly completed and presented meal is presented to the viewers. This section of Philippians is a little like that. We heard last week that Paul encouraged the Philippians to have one mind, one heart, one spirit, and one purpose. And he gave them the example of Jesus and his humility and servanthood to show them the way. Now, Paul gives them another challenge. He challenges them to continue to work out their salvation in their daily lives. The structure of this passage is a little like a cooking show. The first couple of verses are like the chef explaining to the viewers what they're about to make and outlining the ingredients. Then you've got the part where they demonstrate what's going to happen. Here's what it looks like in practice. And then lastly, we have two examples. The here's one I prepared earlier. As Paul puts the spotlight on not just one, but two examples, Timothy and Epaphroditus, to show us what's possible as God works in us by his spirit and what true gospel servants look like. Paul continues to encourage the Philippians to live in a way that reflects their salvation and their identity as followers of Jesus. The examples of Timothy and Epaphroditus point to the essential qualities of gospel leaders and workers. So let's turn to verse 12 as Paul urges the Philippians to work out their salvation with fear and trembling. Therefore, my dear friends, as you have always obeyed, not only in my presence, but now much more in my absence, continue to work out your salvation with fear and trembling. For it is God who works in you to will and to act in order to fulfill his good purpose. This doesn't mean earning salvation by our works. It means living out the implications of our salvation with reverence and seriousness, fully aware of our responsibilities before God. He highlights the importance of obeying God, not just when Paul is present with the Philippians, but especially in his absence. 
For us, we might find it easier to be obedient to God's way when we're at church or when we're being watched. Paul challenges the Philippians and all of us to follow God's way at all times. Paul reassures the Philippians that while they are called to work out their salvation, it is their responsibility, they are not alone in the task. For it is ultimately God who works in them, giving them both the desire and the ability to fulfil his will. We see how Paul emphasises the partnership between God's empowering grace and the believer's active response. Paul then focuses on how they can work out their salvation. And we see that in verses 14 to 16. Do everything without grumbling or arguing so that you may become blameless and pure, children of God without fault in a warped and crooked generation. Then you will shine among them like stars in the sky, as you hold firmly to the word of life. And then I will be able to boast on the day of Christ that I did not run or labour in vain. The believers at Philippi are instructed to do everything without grumbling, without disputing, without complaining, reflecting a spirit of contentment and unity. Why is this so important? Well, it's crucial for maintaining unity within the church and for witness in the world. Paul wants them to be blameless and pure, like children of God, shining as lights in the world, like stars in the sky, in a world, in a generation that is both sinful and evil. Their conduct as followers of Jesus, should stand in stark contrast to the surrounding culture, making their faith attractive to others. And Paul encourages the Philippians to hold fast to the word of life, meaning they should remain steadfast in the gospel message and live by its truth. He expresses his desire that their perseverance and obedience would give him reason to be proud of them on the day of Christ, showing that his work among them was not in vain. And finally, we see how Paul compares his own ministry to a drink offering being poured out. And this means that he is willing to sacrifice himself for their faith, for their spiritual growth. Despite his suffering, Paul rejoices and he calls on the Philippians to share in this joy, even in the face of their challenges and persecution. And so we see how Paul's challenge to the Philippians embraces four major themes. Paul encourages them to have active obedience as they actively live out their faith working in partnership with God's grace. Paul reminds the Philippians of God's power, that God will empower his people to desire and do what pleases him. Paul encourages them for unity and witness, as he warns the Philippians to avoid complaints and arguments and instead foster unity, which will strengthen their witness. And finally, perseverance and joy. Both Paul and the Philippians are encouraged to find joy even in sacrificial service and challenges because it all contributes to their faithfulness in Christ. So this is the task that Paul puts before the Philippians and it is the same task that we have as we live out our faith day by day. Now, as Paul challenges them to work out their salvation, he points to two gospel leaders whom he has prepared earlier who will help them with this. The first is Timothy, 
In verse 19, I hope in the Lord Jesus to send Timothy to you soon, that I also may be cheered when I receive news about you. Timothy was a key figure in the New Testament, a devoted disciple, missionary, and companion of Paul. His life and ministry are highlighted in several of Paul's letters, and he is portrayed as a faithful gospel worker and spiritual leader. Timothy was from Lystra in modern-day Turkey. His mother, Eunice, was a Jewish Christian, and his father was Greek. He was raised in the faith by his mother and grandmother, Lois and was well-versed in the scriptures from a young age. His mixed heritage, being both Jewish and Greek, gave him a unique position to bridge the cultural gaps in early Christian ministry. We read in Acts chapter 16 that Timothy met Paul during one of Paul's missionary journeys, and Paul quickly saw great potential in him. Paul came to Derby and then to Lystra, where a disciple named Timothy lived, whose mother was Jewish and a believer, but whose father was a Greek. The believers at Lystra and Iconium spoke well of him. Paul wanted to take him along on the journey, so he circumcised him because of the Jews who lived in that area, for they all knew that his father was a Greek. Now, Timothy's circumcision wasn't necessary for his salvation, but it did remove a potential barrier for Timothy to minister in different contexts. And so Paul brought him along on several missionary journeys, becoming one of his closest and most trusted companions, helping to establish and strengthen early churches and was involved in teaching, leadership and pastoral care. We see now how Paul outlines Timothy's qualifications for the task he's about to send him to Philippi. And in doing so, he expresses confidence in Timothy's character. First, Timothy shows genuine care for the church. I have no one else like him who will show genuine concern for your welfare. Timothy's distinguishing trait is that he is genuinely concerned for the welfare of the church. Timothy's care reflects the heart of a true gospel worker who is genuinely concerned for the spiritual growth and well-being of others. This quality would have been absolutely necessary to help the Philippians live out their Christian faith with one mind, one heart, one spirit and one purpose in challenging circumstances. Timothy demonstrates selflessness in all he does. For everyone looks out for their own interests, not those of Jesus Christ. If we remember back to last week, Paul encouraged the Philippians to do nothing out of selfish ambition or vain conceit. Rather, in humility, value others above yourselves, not looking to your own interests, but each of you to the interests of others. So here Paul contrasts Timothy's service with those others who seek their own interests rather than the interest of Christ. This points to Timothy's selflessness and his deep commitment to the gospel. His life exemplifies someone fully aligned with the mission of Christ, working not for personal gain, but for the advancement of God's kingdom. We see next Timothy's proven character and partnership in the gospel. But you know that Timothy has proved himself because as a son with his father, he has served with me in the work of the gospel. Paul's confidence is based on what he has seen Timothy do. It's based on Timothy's ministry experience. He has the runs on the board. Timothy's relationship with Paul is described as that of a father and a son, implying a deep mentoring bond. Timothy has faithfully served alongside Paul in challenging situations. And so he has proven his endurance 
and reliability as a gospel worker. And finally, we see that Timothy is trustworthy and dependable. I hope, therefore, to send him as soon as I see how things go with me, and I am confident in the Lord that I myself will come soon. So Paul trusts Timothy enough to send him as his representative to the Philippians. And so this shows how dependable Timothy is in carrying out the mission and in communicating Paul's heart to the church. Paul's confidence in Timothy emphasises the trust and responsibility that a gospel worker must bear, demonstrating integrity and accountability. And so we see through Timothy's example that a gospel worker must genuinely care for others, be selfless, putting the interests of Christ first, be proven through faithful service and be trustworthy in carrying out the mission of God. Timothy's life is a model for Christian service and dedication to the work of the gospel. Timothy is an example of selfless service. Now Paul describes a sacrificial servant in Epaphroditus. We're now in verse 25. But I think it's necessary to send to you, send back to you Epaphroditus, my brother, co-worker and fellow soldier, who is also your messenger, whom you sent to take care of my needs. This undoubtedly meant that Epaphroditus took this letter back to the Philippians. He was a member of the church in Philippi and was sent by the congregation to assist Paul while Paul was imprisoned in Rome. He was also tasked with delivering financial support to Paul on behalf of the Philippian believers, showing his role as a trusted representative of the church. We see the special place that Epaphroditus has in Paul's heart because he gives him three important titles, brother, co-worker, and fellow soldier. This highlights his deep partnership in the gospel. They reflect Epaphroditus's commitment to the mission of Christ, co-worker, his close relationship with Paul, brother, and his willingness to endure hardship for the gospel, fellow soldier. He was a man Paul valued as a partner in the work of ministry, And we see that his role went beyond just delivering the money. He also stayed with Paul to assist him, showing his servant heart and dedication. We then hear that while in Rome, Epaphroditus became seriously ill to the point of almost dying. Despite his life-threatening illness, he remained focused on his mission to serve Paul. His near-death experience deeply affected Paul and caused concern among the Philippians who had heard of his condition. Paul describes his recovery as a mercy from God. After recovering from this serious illness, Paul decides to send Epaphroditus back to Philippi with this letter, reassuring the church that he had recovered and praising him for his faithful service. Paul urges the Philippians to welcome Epaphroditus with joy and honour him for his sacrificial service as he almost died for the work of Christ. Now, when illness prevented Epaphroditus from fulfilling the role of personal attendant to Paul, he may have seemed like a failure, maybe even a malingerer. Maybe he was just hanging around And particularly, that might have been the view of some of the Philippians. But Paul assured them that this was definitely not the case. It was the opposite. Epaphroditus served above and beyond the call of duty. And so we remember Epaphroditus for his selflessness, his dedication, and his sacrificial service. He risked his life to support Paul and serve the church 
demonstrating a willingness to endure suffering for the sake of Christ's work. And so his example serves as a model of humility, perseverance and devotion to the gospel, making him another example of faithful Christian service in the New Testament. The examples of Timothy and Epaphroditus not only show us what it means to work out our salvation, but also point to the essential qualifications for gospel service. They put other people before themselves. They work hard with all their energy. They suffer and don't complain. They aren't afraid to be vulnerable, showing genuine concern for other people's welfare. They carry on their work despite illness. They can't wait to get back in the fight 100% once they're healthy again. They worry that others worry about them. They are Paul's brothers, co-workers and fellow soldiers. The bottom line is that we should honour people who have this character because this is what it looks like to work out your salvation. This is what it looks like to put off arguing and grumbling and instead put on the fruit of the Spirit. Do we always appreciate these qualities in our gospel leaders, our gospel servants? Do we express our gratitude for these qualities? Do we encourage and support them? Do we care for them? As Paul encouraged the Philippians, it's important for us to honour and support those who serve in our church and community. Remember that very simple thing from last week, that we can encourage others with a simple email saying, I prayed for you today. It can be so encouraging to our gospel leaders and gospel servants who by their selfless and sacrificial service help each of us to mature as disciples of Christ. Let us pray. Heavenly Father, we so much thank you for Jesus, for his humility and for his sacrifice, that through his death and resurrection, we are saved. Help us to work out that salvation in our lives, in our hearts and in our minds. We thank you for gospel leaders and gospel servants who you bring into our lives. Help us to honour and support them as they help each of us by your spirit to mature as disciples of Jesus. We pray in Jesus' name. Amen.